Isaia has made landfall in North Carolina. The storm now heading up the coast and will make for dangerous conditions across the mid-Atlantic and northeast today. Plus, President Trump now has Dr. Burks in his sights and a potential milestone in the treatment of major depressive disorder. Here's what you need to know. Good morning. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Tuesday, August 4th. I am Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Good morning, Carlo. Good Tuesday morning to you, Jill. How are things? Uh, things are fine. Uh, a rainy a rainy night last night, and uh, I think you we're going to just be in for more of it. That thunder kept me up last night. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's coming fast and furious up here already. Wait till you get if uh, we if you had a dog, then you'd really feel it because dog <laughs> yeah. mine mine barks uh, the whole night basically. If there's well, if your there's dog having door. having having met that yappy little dog of yours, it barks at just about everything, right? I don't know how you. How I you'd feel live like, like that. you're treading. Uh, I, I would I would be a little careful here. Okay, Carlo. I, I hate see, Trestle's very cute and he's a very loving That's dog. Good. So okay, okay. All right, let's get to uh, the storm. Isaias uh, has been downgraded to a tropical storm after making landfall along the North Carolina coast late last night as a Category 1 hurricane. Wind gusts as high as 93 miles per hour. The storm is moving fast. It's going to sweep through the eastern seaboard today. Tropical storm warnings are in place from Cape Hatteras to Boston, um, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, all likely to see wind speeds of about 60 to 70 miles per hour today. In lower Manhattan, where we have our Cheddar office, there are some flood barriers in place in case of storm surge. Uh, Carlo, I don't think we've really seen that since Superstorm Sandy. No, I don't. I don't think we have either. And, you know, this actually may be the uh, strongest storm to hit the New York City metro area since Sandy, which was back in 2012. And remember, Sandy wasn't technically a hurricane, right? It did all that damage. And it was uh, it was this weird sort of like amalgamation of a nor'easter and a tropical storm, I believe. Um, But, yeah, as I said, you know, the rain has already started here. This thing is moving fast. Um, So just, you know, be be prepared if you live in the northeast today. Be uh, be aware of your surroundings. Try not to to go out too much, though. I don't think anyone's really going out that much anyway to begin with right yeah, hopefully not i mean i was in new york city yesterday uh, for work i did not see all that many people long island is uh i feel like it's bumping i mean i i feel like every every time yeah. i'm out of this house i'm like why is everybody out what is going on well- well, when I was out there, it was, yeah, it, especially by the, by the end of the month, it was, it almost felt like it was like a normal summer out east. Um, you know, not quite, not everything was open, but, you know, there were a lot of people out. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that people who have the, the means to get out of the city have, have decided long ago that that's where they'd rather be. Uh, all right, let's uh, talk a little bit about coronavirus and where things stand right now. President Trump criticizing another member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. This time it is Deborah Burks, Dr. Burks. Um, he called her, quote, pathetic after she issued a stark assessment of how the virus is spreading in the United States. So now Dr. Fauci is defending Dr. Burks, saying that he agrees that the U.S. is seeing uncontrolled community spread in many areas, urban and rural, um, by asymptomatic people who are carrying the virus. Schools have started to reopen in some states with chaotic results. There have been quarantines, postponements, and closures as students and teachers have been bringing this uh, virus back to school with them. Oh God, the school question. Is there a more vexing question? I don't think anybody knows. And we're now, you know, we're now approaching the, uh, we're, we're, we're approaching, you know, when it happens, I didn't even realize that schools actually go back uh, so early in some parts of the South and Midwest. But but yeah, the first week of August is when it happens. And it, as you said, has been chaotic, to say the least. Um, you know, Jill, back to the president. Uh, there was an interview. Uh, Axios uh, has a show on HBO and they and they, their reporter, Jonathan Swan, their political reporter, who's a really fantastic uh, reporter. He interviewed President Trump on the show last night. It's probably worth watching. It may actually not be worth watching if you want to keep your sanity, uh, because it was jaw dropping, frankly. And I know that, you know, those words get thrown around a lot these days and don't really mean anything anymore. But, you know, this was watching somebody who is in appears to be in complete denial about what is happening in the country that they lead. Um, The president said that the death toll, quote, is what it is. 
Uh, he continued to make a bunch of false claims about testing, um, about how we're actually doing really well when you consider deaths as a proportion of cases. I don't really even know what that means, uh, saying, you know, we have the lowest in the world. Um, but of course, you know, it is deaths as a as a proportion to population that's relevant, and that's where we're failing. And and Jonathan Swan over at Axios did a very good job of, of pressing him on that. So, there, you know, there wasn't much to, to, to glean from it um, other than just it, it's a good snapshot, I think, of where we are right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I was watching an interview last night, um, and there was a doctor on and he was saying, you know, the, the analogy he used that he used, which was about weather, actually, I thought was, was, I don't know, I thought it was effective. So he said, if you had a hurricane coming, right, um, which would mean that's the equivalent of like what we have now in terms of cases, you would shelter in place, you'd go into the basement, you know, you, you would hunker down. Um, if you had just a bad storm coming, okay, well, maybe you wouldn't stock up on stuff, but you would certainly stay right. inside for, for the duration of the storm. If you had, uh, you know, some rain, light rain, and you were sending your kids out, whatever, you'd make sure that they had umbrellas and, uh, you know, and if it was sunny and, and no rain and whatnot, well, that's when you don't have to worry about it. You leave the house and you don't take any precautions and, and whatever. Um, and it, it I, I, it, that's where we are. And I feel like we're kind of like going outside in a hurricane without protective gear, you know, in a lot of ways. It, well, and, and to, to bastardize that analogy even more, it's like going out in a hurricane that's been, you know, here for like five months and still going outside without an umbrella. That's the thing that's just so upsetting about it is that, you know, this is not, we're not in February and March here, folks. Like we're, we're five months into this game. And the thing but, is, in terms of school, um, you know, so women have made a lot of progress when it comes to to just being in the workplace. Uh, we still don't make on on average, you know, the same as men. Um, but there were at some point in the past few years, there were more women in the workplace than men. Um, a lot of those gains that we have made in the last few decades have really been drawn back. I interviewed um, this woman who wrote an article about it for the, the for the 19th. And it, it's she basically discusses how, you know, because women are still, in most cases, the primary caregivers, um, and because there is no school and or child care, a lot of women have had to, you know, take a step back at work and care for their kids. Um, and, and, you know, what is that going to do in the long run for, for women in the workplace as we've just sure. reached a point where we've made so much progress? Look, personally, I, I'm fortunate. My husband has he's taking care of my daughter uh, while I am working, but he can't work. Like so we are now, right. you know, a, a one income household because of this. Um, and we are hoping that she can go to some type of we have her signed up for a school program in the fall. Um, and we're hoping that she could go to it because that would mean he could start working again. You know, if if he wasn't able to take the time, then I would basically have had to take leave. You know, I would have had to take a leave at work um, because yeah. we didn't we don't have child care. So it, it's, you know, and I'm one of the fortunate ones. Uh, exactly. But this is a very real thing. No, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I don't have anything to add, Jill. That's uh, you are you are fortunate, and it's, it's if it's as hard as it is on somebody like you, imagine how hard it is on on people who don't have, you know, that that extra little pad, right? Or they don't have a husband who can um, who's able to, uh, you know, to to not work for a little bit of time. You know, right? I mean, so, so we depressing. moved in with our in laws, so we don't have rent. I mean, there's just a few things that you do to figure it out, but, um, you know, you just again the this the health crisis cannot be disconnected from the economic crisis. It's all together. And it right. feels sometimes like we've forgotten that. Yeah, it feels all the time like we've forgotten that. Um, I'm trying to stay optimistic on that here. Note, pardon? Sorry? I'm trying to stay optimistic here, Jill. You know, we, I, I had my big breakthrough on, sta on my staycation, and I'm really trying to, to stick with it here. And you're killing all me. All right, well, let's... I, I'm sorry, <laughs> not, I'm sorry. Just, I'm, I'm, um, okay, I'm the retail... This is not going to help, Carlo. No. The retail <laughs> bankruptcies keep on coming. Lord & Taylor, the oldest department store in this country, has filed for bankruptcy protection, joining Neiman Marcus. The parent company of Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Bank also filed for bankruptcy, joining Brooks Brothers. The pace of retail bankruptcies through the first half of this year has far exceeded the entirety of 2019. 
Yeah. So Joseph A. Bank, I don't know. You're not a uh, you're not a man. So I don't know if you have a uh, connection to Joseph <laughs> to Joseph A. Bank. But this is that's sort of the store where uh, every I think every American male bought like their first real business suit. And they would have these they would have these insane promotions always on TV, at least in the New York area. That was like, you know, 10 suits for ten dollars. Come on in. Um, but anyway, it is sad. Uh, it, it was sad when Brooks Brothers went under. Um it's sad that Lauren Taylor is going bankrupt. I mean, I remember going there with my mom, uh, you know, staying home from school and going shopping with my mom at the local Lauren Taylor growing up. Um, but also, you know, this is this is a good uh, point to remember that there's two kinds of bankruptcies. Uh, you know, there's the liquidate, sell the fixtures at auction, you know, see a later bankruptcy, which is typically a chapter seven. Um, and then there's the financial maneuver to like get rid of debt and renegotiate your lease bankruptcy, which is chapter 11. For the most part, what we've been seeing this year is the ladder. Um, that doesn't mean it won't turn into the former. Um, but I, I feel like this is one of those things that we were never really taught in school. I was always sort of like taught that like bankruptcy means the end of a business. It's just like over. Um, and that's not always true. So just, just an important, important thing to keep your mind, keep in mind when you hear a company is filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy, it doesn't mean that company is going away. I think that that's a great, um, that's a great point. And Taylor, uh, their parent company also filed for bankruptcy. They, I get their emails and they sent an email saying, we're not going anywhere. You know, you do, you could shop, uh, you could still have your store credits. Like, you know, don't worry. We're, we're still going to be here for you. Lord and Taylor yeah. also filed for bankruptcy. And this is at a time when Amazon, uh, their sales or their revenue was up 40% in the last quarter. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many headwinds, right? It's like we've been talking about this retail apocalypse, as we call it, even before coronavirus with all of these things. And then look at a company like a men's warehouse or a Joseph A. Bank or Brooks Brothers. Who the heck is in the market for a new suit right now? I'm in the market for new athletic shorts, and <laughs> that's about it, right? That's it. It's that's true. the only thing I'm buying. Well, I had, you know, Baker was on for you last week um, and Baker's on air. So he's buying new suits still. And he's like, right. I, I, he's like, that. he's like, even the salespeople are like, uh, are you sure? What are you doing? Yeah, right. To, for your uh, Zoom calls. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a really sad time. And the longer this goes on, you know, the heart is as needless to say, as states have to shut down again. And as, you know, as, as this drags on, it's only going to be harder for, for these retailers. Um, well, Jill, okay, I, we have so a before, before we move on, I do want to I just say one thing. I'm and I'm sorry to to draw this out, but that that's I think that's a very important point because you know, you don't have to shed a tear for Brooks Brothers or Lord and Taylor. But think about the, you know, the small businesses. There was this report in New York City by a um I, oh God, I forget it was called the Partnership for New York City. Uh, and they said that a third, they think that a third of small businesses in New York City may go under. Um that's like uh, you know, that's that's a th that's thousands of businesses. Those are the diners, the shoe guy, the coffee guy, the restaurants. Those are the ones you got to shed a tear for because those pe those you know they those kinds of organizations and companies they don't have the ability. They don't have you know creditors and and lenders that they can try and do this like restructuring with. Like, you know, if they're not making money, that's it. So I have a very strong connection um, to the guys who run all the coffee carts in New York City. And I, I don't know if this is a New York City thing, um, but for people who don't live in, in New York City, they have basically on every other corner, you have somebody you have a cart that has they're selling coffee, hard boiled eggs, some donuts, uh, a bagel. Some of them sell other, you know, um, pretzels or whatever, whatever it is. And, and of course, yeah. food trucks became really popular as well. So I always get my coffee from, from the carts because I always work super early hours and yeah, they're, um, the guys out there. they're the only game in town. So at that hour, and I always think these are the hardest working guys. I mean, they are set up and ready to go. I used to be at the stock exchange at, at two in the morning um, and they were the only people out setting up and I could get a hot cup of coffee. So I'm, you know, I back at work a, a few days a week and there's like one, I'd say that there's a couple of guys. I mean, you had a car on every single corner. Yeah. Maybe there's a few that are still out there and I, I, my heart breaks for them. I mean, I wonder, I had a tab going with, with, uh, the guy who was in front of our building. I still don't remember. Do I even owe him money? Does he owe me? But like, I, I, my heart breaks for them because right. I, I don't know what you do if, if that is like a cash business where people are – you need people out and about. Exactly. Yeah. I really don't know the answer. It's so upsetting. 
Um, all right, let's switch gears here. A major medical breakthrough that has nothing to do with coronavirus. The FDA has approved an antidepressant nasal spray for use in actively suicidal patients. It's the first time a drug uh, has been given the green light for use in people who are planning to kill themselves and a major milestone for mental health treatment. The quick acting spray called Spravato is a close cousin to the drug ketamine. It's been used for, uh, for treatment resistant depression for the last year, but never for people in the midst of an acute suicidal episode. So this is, yeah, this is, um, I think, a very important story that didn't get a lot of attention yesterday when this FDA uh, approval came out. So there's 17 million Americans who have major depressive disorder, not just depression, but like, you know, crippling depression. Uh, Johnson Johnson, which makes this drug, um, says 12 percent of them may be actively contemplating suicide at any one time. And those are the people who could be helped by this. Uh, you know, Joe, we don't talk about the mental health crisis in this country nearly enough. Not 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 you and I. I'm just like the the media in general. Um, it's still taboo, which is really ridiculous when you think about it. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever talked about it on this podcast, but one of my very best friends who I grew up with uh, committed suicide about five years ago, um, and he was in treatment. Uh, he, you know, it, it, it's not like it came out of nowhere. He was really struggling, and he had people, um, you, you know, caring for him, uh, and 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 still. Um, and I think that he, I just wonder, you know, he would be the kind of person who maybe could have benefited. Uh, from this drug. So I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned it today. And this is something that I think if you have somebody in your life um, who is, who, you know, who has acute suicidal ideations, um, this is a, this is a story that, 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 that they and the people who care for them uh, just should know about. Um, you know, Carlo, and, and I'm sorry for your loss. Actually, when I was in high school, I dated somebody um, and he committed suicide in college. Um, and it, it's it's heartbreaking. And you do have to think if if it wasn't so taboo to talk about this stuff. I mean, this was many years ago. And, and if there were, were some type of, of treatment, could it make a difference? So, you know, I said this has nothing to do with the pandemic, but in some ways it does, because we don't know really what the mental health impact of this year is going to be. Um, but I, it's not going to be good. I mean, the numbers are going right. to show a lot more people um, are suffering from depression right now than they were pre-pandemic. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, Jill. And uh, right, we just don't know. I mean, we, we could be in the beginning of a, of, a, of a, you know, resurgent mental health crisis in this country. It's probably just too early to know that. But I guess all we can say is, you know, if you know somebody who's hurting, one of the, you know, one of the... Uh, the things I always wonder about my friend Mike was, you know, was he somebody, you know, could we, that's the hard thing with, with suicide, right? Because you just, you, you wonder, is that, you know, was there something more I could have done? Um, was I, you know, was I not being a good enough friend? Was I not, was I not in touch enough? So, I mean, the only thing you can say about something like that is just, you know, when in doubt, reach out to people who are, who are hurting. And there's a lot of people hurting right now. Um, yeah, well said, Carlo. Uh, okay, the MLB and the NBA have been getting all the headlines, but another pro sports league has been showing a lot of success in its restarted season. The National Hockey League resumed play over the weekend, and uh, the league says no players or staff members have tested positive for COVID-19 since they arrived in two Canadian hub cities. The NHL is playing a 24-team postseason round robin. The Western Conference is playing in Edmonton. The East is playing in Toronto. Yeah, it's actually a, uh, a, a, a listener, and I'm, I'm forgetting his name. I think I want to say Ed uh, uh, emailed us the other day, and he was like, "Yo, you got to talk about the NHL because they're really they're kicking butt." And it's true, they, uh, you know, they're they're doing something similar to the NBA, and they're having similar results. On the flip side, in baseball land, which is just continuing to be a complete, you know what, uh, the the St. Louis Cardinals have this outbreak now. In addition to the Marlins, they're saying that that outbreak may have started because a bunch of the players went to a casino. Needless to say, probably shouldn't have done that if that's if that's confirmed. Uh, and then the commissioner of the MLB, uh, Robert Manfred, uh, he warned the players union that he may shut down the season because it's just not it's just such a mess right now. It's like, dude, you made the plan like you're the head of the MLB. Like they're not just out there playing for the heck of it. Like this is the plan that they were given. And I mean, I, I you know. I think the MLB, the, the, the problems here are very, uh, there's a lot of blame to go around. But like, you know, the NBA figured this out. Baseball did not figure it out. And now they're seeing outbreaks like this is what you should expect. 
Um, I'm I I just pulled up this tweet. Um, the Islanders coach Barry Trotz. Um, he basically said uh, that he feels great in the NHL bubble in Toronto. He said, "Quote." For me personally, it's like a giant man cave. Life in the bubble is good. Uh, I <laughs> thought that was just super funny. Uh, you know, hockey, I wish I could get into hockey. I've tried in the past, and I just can't. I know that you're in Long Island. I know Long Island people are, are, are into the Islanders uh, and the Rangers. Um, I don't know. Is, but you are you guys aren't, right? You guys aren't hockey fans, are you? I'm not a big hockey fan. I just, I, I just love that and the idea of, um, you know, we were talking about, like, is the bubble – the, the basketball bubble, you know, woe is me for these players. What's so bad about it? I mean, besides for the fact that they're not with their family, they're playing basketball, they're eating good food. It's not for, a, you know, it's just a couple of months. And being paid and being paid millions of and dollars. Being Don't paid a ton that. of money to do it. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, everybody. That is what you need to know for Tuesday, August 4th. Thanks, guys.